Michelle Ray's going to read. Let's have you stand. We're going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. And Michelle's going to read for us, and then we're going to dive in to things. Let's read. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting with verse 24. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the one who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over, oh yeah, to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. You may be seated. I have to be honest in that, you know, I'm a little at angst in, in, um, in sharing, you know, what I'm going to talk about today with you because in a lot of ways, we, we live in a culture that is, that is never satisfied by anything. Nothing is, nothing is ever good enough for us. I wrestle this, with this in my own life. I know others, I have friends that wrestle with this. For whatever reason, nothing in our culture is good enough. And what's interesting is this, this passage of Scripture really dovetails nicely with the last seven verses, but I'll be honest with you, last week, you know, my wife knew what I was preaching on, knew the text, and I uh, heard what Pastor Keith preached on and was like, uh, what are you going to preach on? He's kind of preaching about this, and I'm, I'm like, well... There's a lot more here than, than meets the eye. Um, there was once an old man. This is a story, hypothetical. There was once an old man who got too old for his family to take care of. If you've ever had, you know, grandparents or, or older people in your life, um, for whatever reason, you know, the health began to fail and, and they really found it fitting to, to have him put in a, nurs- in a nursing home. And so they did. The guy was really reluctant about it at first. Of course, who wouldn't be, right? Who wants to wants to do that, but the family, they needed more specialized care, and so eventually he realized that and realized that he needed to go and, and, and do that. His first day there, he's, he's, he's in his room, and his family, like, fills the room with flowers and cards and balloons and stuff just to sort of make him feel, you know, at home and just sort of make the room all up and all that thing, and he's sort of laying there, sitting there for several hours, thinking about his life, beginning to contemplate things in his life. And all of a sudden, one of the nurses comes in to sort of greet him and welcome him, that sort of thing. And she goes up to him and she finds out that this guy is actually quite interesting. And so she sits down and he begins to tell her his life story. He begins to share with her all kinds of things. This guy's really quite fascinating. And and next to his bed on the nightstand was this uh, bowl of peanuts. And so inadvertently, she just begins, you know, helping herself to these peanuts. And if you've, I love like, uh, I love peanuts. I love chips. You, ever, you can have just one, right? And so she starts helping herself to these, to these peanuts. And, and all of a sudden, she's been talking with this guy. She looks at the clock and she's like, holy cow, I have other responsibilities I need to take care of. I got to get out of here. And, uh, and, and, and so she starts to try to wrap up the conversation. And then she looks over at the bowl of peanuts and they're almost gone. And she just starts to feel real guilty. Like she ate all these guys, pe- this guy's peanuts. This is a bad thing. And so she apologizes and she says, oh, I'm so sorry, I ate all your peanuts. And and the guy said, that's okay, ever since I lost my teeth, I'm only able to suck the chocolate off them anyways. (laughs) What is it, Lay's potato chips? You can't eat just one, right? Um, (laughs) You thought I was starting on a whole somber note, right? I want to challenge you today with a few things regarding this text. It dovetails really nicely. If you read the, past, the last seven verses, the previous seven verses that we sort of looked at last week, um, they fit rather nicely. But what I want to sort of challenge you today in is, is the, the notion that we have regarding where we find our satisfaction. What are the things that we find our satisfaction in in this life? Okay? Not only that, but understanding the difference between the temporal and eternal things that we choose to invest our life in. 
And so looking at this text, we're going to go um, further into this. And I think the question to be answered today is this. What is a teacher trying to communicate to us about true satisfaction in life? By the way, if you have a bulletin, inside there's little sermon notes. question is this. What is the teacher trying to communicate to us about true satisfaction in life? And I think the answer is this. The teacher is trying to teach us that there is no true satisfaction or enjoyment apart from the hand of God. The things we chase after in this life will one day mean nothing to us. We cannot find meaningful satisfaction in the material goods we toil for in this life. There is nothing truly gratifying in this life that comes solely from our own toil. All good and perfect gifts come from the hand of God. The word for the day is satisfaction, or I'm sorry, satisfy. So what can we learn from this text? Well, first of all, I think we can learn that true satisfaction only comes from the hand of God. Right? We can read that rather, it's just jumping out of the text with us. And we often try to find satisfactions in things that we do, like work and, and play and the things that we buy, the things that we have, and, and that sort of thing. And we search for satisfaction from these things. And in some sense, you know, when we, when we work, the paycheck that we get, if you get a paycheck, you know, it, it serves to satisfy a certain degree of your expectation out of your job. Um, if you agree with your employer that you're going to make eight, nine, ten dollars an hour and you work 40 hours, the paycheck that you receive as a result of that, if it's honest, is going to satisfy in a sense or should satisfy your expectation from your employer to a certain degree. We seek to find satisfaction in all kinds of things in life. Now, James 1.17 says this, every good and perfect gift, some of my Bible quizzers know this one, right? Is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Because, and this is one of the things that I want us to really grasp today, you are a soul. You have a body. When this life is over, your soul continues on. And sort of what I want us to put under the microscope today is this sense that in our culture, we tried so desperately to find the, the satisfaction, find a sense of satisfaction from the stuff that we have in life. C.S. Lewis once said this, and we've said this before in, in various quotes and sermons, if I find it in myself, in my desires, in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. In our household, Angie and I pretty much call the shots, okay? If you're a parent here, by the way, here's a little advice. Call the shots in your household. Don't let your children parent you because you're the parent. Um, in our household, you know, we try to call the shots, all right? You know, when it comes to, you know, what we allow our kids to have, what we allow the kids to do, a lot of times we, we call the shots on that stuff. Doesn't mean they don't have freedom. Doesn't mean... That we're, you know, keeping them in a cage and just let them out every, you know, 15 minutes or so. But everything comes from our hand in terms of what they get to experience in life in a lot of ways. You know, sometimes we even just bless them just because. You know, or we bless them because of things like chores. We'll ask, if you do this, you know, I'll give you this. We love you. We want, you know, to teach you the value of work. And so we might compensate you in such and such a way to do this. Okay, for me, sometimes I like... I like give them money to give me back rubs and stuff like that. I know that's kind of weird, but it's cheaper than a masseuse. <laughs> but all those things, the blessings like the money and, the, you know, take them to do fun stuff, blessing them in that way all comes from our hand, right? The blessings that we experience, life, we experience in life come similarly from the hand of God. And I'll give you an example to sort of from my life to sort of tie this in. Last Friday, um, I, took, I picked the girls up from school and we had to go to the bank to take care of some business and, and I did deposit a uh, check and we... We get into the bank, and the girls come in, and we're just blasted with the smell of popcorn. You ever go to a movie theater, right? And you, that smell, you just, you, you start to, your mouth starts to water, and you're like, mmm, and the girls, the girls get this sort of like zombie look on their face. <laughs> they walk in there, and the sm huh? You know, and, and so they go over, and they find the popcorn, and they only to realize that uh, they're asking for money for the popcorn. It's a bank, right? <laughs> But it was for a good cause. 
And so they proceeded to ask me, Dad, do, I have, do you have any money? We want some popcorn. Dad, please, can I have some money? And I said, oh, and even though I was at a bank, I just put it all in. And I'm like, uh, I just gave it to the lady. I got nothing in here. So Lizzie gets this really brilliant idea. Lizzie knows, okay, and some of you guys might, might be able to relate to this. Lizzie knows that our car is a bottomless pit of spare change. <laughs> okay, amen, right? Okay, maybe like recliners too in your household. In ours, it's the car. And so Lizzie's like, we're going to go get the money out of the car. So her and Olivia are like, oh yeah, they run out there and they open the door and they're starting to go through stuff and they, they get all this change together and they come back inside and then they say, Dad, look, we found all this money. We're going to give the lady the money. And, and I'm like, and they're like, we could buy the popcorn. And of course, I can't say no, right? <laughs> and and so, uh, so they did. They buy the popcorn and she starts, him, her and Olivia start to eat their popcorn. And, and I asked them, I said, can I have some? At which point, Lizzie did an interesting thing. And I almost think it was providential. Because she, at that point, she said, well, Dad, I paid for it. <laughs> and it was at that point that I, I gave my uh, daughters a lesson in familial economics. <laughs> and I said to Lizzie, oh, really? So you have the job that gives you the check, that gives you the money to spend to have loose change to fall in the pockets of the seats in order to collect and buy popcorn with. Okay, Dad. <laughs> you know, the point that I'm trying to make is sort of, you know, God does this with life too. Um, she realized that, they, that day that she didn't, she didn't earn that money. It just sort of, we, we earned it, we spent it, whatever reason it came out of our pockets and... I think it gets sucked. You know, there's like a little like vacuum that just kind of, you sit down and goes zoop, like that. In our car, at least, that's the way it works. Washing machines, recliners, all kinds of places we lose change. But I think what was interesting about this and how it kind of ties into what we're looking at today is, is Lizzie was blessed inadvertently by uh, something that I left, that I lost. Okay? That it was sort of like she had to go search for, but it was there. And I think God is similar in that God leaves blessings in our life in all different places, in very unexpected ways, that sometimes we have to live life and have to go about life in such a way where we, we find those blessings along the way. But they're only really satisfying if we truly understand that those blessings come from the hand of God in the first place. Because without God, we wouldn't be here. It's only by God's grace that we are here. We deserve hell because of our sin, but God in his grace and his love and his mercy allows us to continue on in hoping that we can, that he can reconnect with us and hoping that something that was lost at the fall can be restored through what Jesus did on the cross. Satisfaction in our work is just one way that God chooses to bless us. Um, you know, just like my, my daughter's appetite was satisfied by those many blessings that added up that allowed her to buy that popcorn, you know, God in our work sometimes, he will bless us with a sense of satisfaction from what we do that is only explainable in the context of the eternal. I love what Ray Stedman said. There's a quote in your, uh, uh, your sermon outline that says this from Ray Stedman. It says, isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panting after every pleasure, the less you will find. But the more you take life as a gift from God's hand, Responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of the moment, the more life seems to come to you. Even the trials, the heartaches, the handicaps that others seek to avoid are touched with the blessing of heaven administered to the heart of the one who has learned to take them from the hand of God. You know, it's crazy because you meet people in this life and, and you know they're believers, they're followers of Jesus, but this, these, these horrible things t tend to happen with them and they're all like, they've got this peace that doesn't make sense. 
to the world about it. Because the satisfaction that they're finding is that they're finding satisfaction in God knowing that God is going to redeem all of this stuff. The second thing I think is true of this is that true satisfaction does not come from stuff. And this is something that we struggle with in our culture because we live in a society, we live in a culture that says you should never be satisfied with what you have. You should never be satisfied by having just this. You need this. You should never be satisfied with this car. You need this better car that has whatever. Or this house. You, know, you need this house with extra land. Or you, you, know, you, you shouldn't be satisfied with, with whatever it is you have. Your job. You've got to have something more that's going to pay you more because that's the American dream, right? Earn more. Never be satisfied. One of the things I love that John Wesley said, he, he once said, save a lot of money, or earn a lot of money, save a lot of money, give a lot of money away. Um, and this isn't a sermon about money, but we would be wise to understand where the source of money as a blessing comes from. <sighs> you know, if you're living under the sun, S-U-N, you have to realize that anything tangible that you attempt to find satisfaction in in this life is temporal. Undoubtedly, you've heard the, the phrase, you know, you don't find a U-Haul behind a hearse. Anybody ever heard that before? Because you can't take it with you. And one of the things I think is funny, and I think it'd be kind of a funny joke, would be, you know, when I die to, um, to put a U-Haul behind the hearse just to say someone did it. But everything in this life is temporal. If you're trying to find satisfaction in something that, that it has a shelf life, Right? Realize this, everything in this life has a shelf life. Even us, like my shelf life may be 67, 80, 90 years. But eventually, everything I acquire is going to be worthless to me. So why do I get stuck in this cycle? And I don't know about you, but I get stuck in this cycle where it's like I feel like i got to have more. I'm not satisfied with simply what God has, has given me as a blessing. I've got to have more. Why is that? Maybe you struggle with it too. Whether it's work or anything we work toward, we will never find true satisfaction in it until we recognize and pursue the source of that satisfaction. Um, <laughs> speaking of money, I have some quotes about money that might lighten things up a bit. Um, the trick, this was by an IRS agent of all people, said this. He said, the trick is to stop thinking, thinking of it as your money. Oh, yeah, okay. Slow there. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor said this, money is the best deodorant. Okay, Earl Wilson, I don't know who that is, but he says, if you, if you think nobody cares you're alive, try missing a couple of car payments. Uh, nervous laughter, right? Sam Ewing said this, inflation is when, this is great, I love this one because it, has to do with me. Inflation says when you pay $15 for the $10 haircut you used to get for $5 when you had hair. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else said this, always borrow money from a pessimist, pessimist because he never expects to be paid back. Will Smith uh, uh, said one funny, a good one, I, I think this is great coming from Will Smith especially, he said, too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. There it is. It's true. Yeah, there's an amen. You don't got to say amen, but you can't say ouch. Money can't buy happiness, but it can buy you the kind of misery you prefer, right? Ron Kittle, I'm so poor I can't even pay attention. Uh -huh. Josh Billings, you should always live within your income, even if you have to borrow to do so. He must have been a politician. I'm just kidding. We didn't actually overspend, as Keith Davis says this, we didn't actually overspend our budget. The allocation simply fell short of our expectations. And Franklin Jones says this, a bargain is something you can't use at a price you can't resist. Um, there, was, there was once this man who, older man, was retiring, wanted to buy a house, and he, he was looking at these houses, and he bought one by a middle school. Okay? <laughs> Someone already knows where this is going. He bought it by a middle school, and uh, he was warned by some neighbors. He says, you're going to regret it. There's some kids, they come through here, and they're gonna, you're going to regret it. And he's like, oh, okay, well, I, I, this is the best I can get. So he buys the house, and he moves in. And uh, fall comes around, school's in session, and all of a sudden school lets out, and this group of boys comes by, and they think they're like, 
you know, the marching drum brigade or something, got these sticks in their hands, and they're banging on everything they come in contact with, okay? You name it, trash cans, cars, mailboxes, trees, you know, whatever's left out in the eye. They're just banging on this stuff, and he walks with his house. Every day, these kids would do this, and the guy was kind of getting a little frustrated by it. I don't know about you, but my mom used to do this, too. If I would tap on stuff, she'd say, stop it! You know, she would really just cut me off. She'd really drive her nuts. So it started to drive this guy really nuts, and so he got this really great, brilliant idea. And he decided that he was going to start paying these kids to do what they were doing. In fact, they, the kids came over, and he, and, and he gathered them all around, and he said, hey, guys, come on over, come on over. Come on. He says, here, I love what you're doing here. I love what you're doing. I'm going to pay you a dollar every day you got, each of you, a dollar, every day you come here. And, and do your thing, you know? Can we do this every day after school? Stop by, play a little bit. I'll give you a dollar. You'll be on your way. And the kids are like, boo, yeah, cha-ching, you know? And they get these, you know, so they're all excited. Next day they come back. They're banging on everything. Guy pays them a dollar. Week goes by and the guy does this. The next week comes around though and the kids come by and the guy goes out there and he says, hey guys, you know, I had some unexpected bills come up and uh, I'm only going to be able to pay you 50 cents this week. The kids are like, well, all right, well, we'll just keep going. They start banging on stuff, and they're really rocking out, having a good time, you know, just being a nuisance, but just having fun with it, you know, like kids do. Um, and, and so a week goes by, and they come back the next week, and the, the guy comes out, and he says, oh, guys, I got, you know, I, I had all these bills, but my, my unemployment check, my, uh, my uh, Social Security check didn't come in, and so this week I'm only going to be able to pay you a quarter. And the boys are like, what? A lousy quarter? We quit this gig. And they never bothered him again. <laughs> You see, where, what am I, where am I going with this? By turning the drummers, by turning their fun work, you know, their fun into work, you know, the, my, the wise man was able to pretty much suck the satisfaction they got out of what they were doing. You know what I mean? And uh, from what they're doing. And sometimes the devil tries to do the same thing with us. You know, when we work for um, certain things and we all of a sudden find in ourselves this sense that we are never satisfied with where we're at. We're never satisfied with the blessing God gives us, you know, the life and that satisfaction is sucked from us continually. I love what Tommy Nelson said, and this is another quote in your sermon outline. It says, man can find nothing in, his, in this finite life to give him an infinite peace. Hear that again. Man can find nothing, how much? Nothing in this life to give him an infinite peace. Man must go outside himself or he will live his life in despair. And the only way a person can avoid this is by living in denial. In conclusion, don't get your hopes up. Because <laughs> this is kind of where I want to park and sort of bring this home a bit. In conclusion, I think, so what, what, what should we do with this? A, I think we need to retool our hearts. So that our satisfaction is found in the eternal. You know, if you're living life under the sun, the S-U-N, you are in fact chasing wind. If you hope to find satisfaction in the temporal, your efforts will always, always, always come up empty-handed. Everything in this life will one day be different some of it will cease to exist, but what will continue on is what's important. If you notice in verses 25 and 26, that they look at those things that God gives as those blessings, you notice all of them, none of them are, are, are things that are temporal. None of them are things, that it's, not like, it's not like the thing that God blesses us with, a, a pony, a house, a brand new Xbox, or whatever it is that you, you know, I'm thinking of teens here, they want a pony, Xbox, whatever. None of those things are temporal things. They're what? Wisdom happiness. What was the other? Someone say it. Who's got their Bible open? Wisdom, happiness, and knowledge. Last I knew you couldn't give me a slice of knowledge. You couldn't give me three cups of pie. I mean, you couldn't give me three cups of wisdom. You could give me a slice of pie, and then I would be in heaven. But that would, be, that would not be good for me anymore. <laughs> so retool your heart so that your satisfaction is found in the eternal. 
um, what, it, what it means to retool. You think, of, you think of when you need to change something. Um, one of the things I love to do is I love to hack things. Okay? I, I love to find alternative uses for things that people are like, you got to use it for this. And I'm like, no, you can use it for this. You just got to change this. We need to retool our hearts so that our satisfaction is no longer found in what's temporal, what's here, what's now, what's going to be gone when we die. We need to focus on and find our satisfaction in the things that are eternal, the blessings that God gives us that are going to really matter. Um, there once was this fisherman. I'm going to read you the story. He said, one, one day a fisherman was kind of lying on a beautiful beach. And he had his line out in, in, in the ocean. And, and he was fishing, just sort of relaxing there on the sand one day. And all of a sudden this businessman came up to him. He came walking down the beach, and he was sort of trying to relieve his, you know, sort of tension from the day, get out of the office. And he noticed the fisherman sitting there, and he decided to find out why the fisherman was fishing instead of working harder, you know, work harder to make a living for himself and his family. So he says to the guy, you aren't going to catch much fish like that, you know. He said to the businessman, you should be working rather than lying on this beach fishing. And the fisherman looked up the businessman and replied, and what would my reward be for that? Well, you can get bigger nets and, and cast more fish. Catch more fish, was the businessman's response. And then what will my reward be, said the fisherman, still smiling. The businessman, you will make money and you will be able to buy a boat, which will then result in a larger catch of fish. And then what will my reward be? The businessman was beginning to get a little bit irritated, and he said, well, you can buy a bigger boat and hire some people to work for you, he said. And then, what will my reward be? And the businessman started to get a little angry. Started to get a little ticked. He said, don't you understand? You could build up a fleet of fishing boats. Sail all over the world and let all your employees catch fish for you. And kind of cocky-like, he said, and what will my reward be? The businessman became very, very angry with this fisherman. And he started to shout. He said, don't you understand that you could become so rich that you will never have to work a, for your living again? You could spend all the rest of your days sitting on this beach looking at the sunset. You won't have a care in the world. The fisherman, still smiling, looked up and said, what do you think I'm doing now? You know, there are all kinds of people that, that work extremely hard in their life trying to find satisfaction in something that's a whiff of smoke when you think about it. Something that is here today and gone tomorrow. Something that will be gone when we die. You see, the businessman just didn't get it. And according to Scripture, we work to bring God glory. Work is one of the ways that we worship God. Paul wrote in Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. True happiness comes from serving God, not from accumulating wealth. Whatever you do, Paul writes, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In Colossians 3.17. Our reward is that God is glorified and we are fulfilled as human beings because that is what we were created to do. And I think we get this mixed up even in the church. We, we look at the fall and we think, oh man, because of the fall, I got to work now. And then we dread work. We, look, we talk badly about work because we always point back to the fall and we say, oh man, look what Adam and Eve made me do, right? When was work created? Was it before or after the fall? Before the fall. You see, God created us to work. What happened as a result of the fall is that, that, that work became toilsome. Because we live in a sinful world now, we have to toil sometimes in our work in order to make ends meet. But work itself is a good thing, and it is an act, and it is an act of worship. When we look at and acknowledge the fact that God has given us work as a blessing, when we find our satisfaction in Christ... It becomes far easier for us to look at the work, whatever it is, whatever your situation, whatever your job is, to be able to look at that work and say, you know what, I'm not working for a mere paycheck, I'm working for something that's eternal. And we've lost that in this culture. We've lost that in the church. 
Everything we do is spiritual. Everything. You are a soul. You just so happen to have a body. B, live life under the sun. Find your satisfaction in Christ regardless of what you are doing and be content with what you should be contented with. There was a, I'm going to tell you another story. Once upon a time, there was a stone cutter. I like to tell stories. Is that okay? Okay. Um, once upon a time, there lived a stone cutter who went every day to this mountain to cut stones. And while he worked, he whistled and he sang. And for though he was poor, he had everything he wanted. And he was a happy man. You kind of hear the little birds chirping and the singing and the la di da di da well, suddenly a voice from, I'm sorry, then one day he was called to work at this mansion of this very rich man. And he goes to work and he sees the mansion and he's like, whoa, this is amazing. I wish I were a rich man and had a mansion. Pow! Your wish, he hears this voice that says, your wish is granted. And all of a sudden he became rich and, and, he, and the voice said, from now on anything you want will be given to you. And the stone cutter returned home that evening and he found this mansion that was his and, and, and it just was this amazing thing that replaced his small hut. And the stone cutter gave up on cutting stones, as some of us would probably, and began to live the life of a rich man. One day he was sitting in front of his mansion when he saw a king and all his noblemen passed by. And he said to himself, oh, I wish I were a king. I wish I were a king sitting in the cool comfort of a royal current, a carriage. Pow, your wish is granted. And all of a sudden, this guy is a king. Once again, his wish is granted. He becomes the king, and he's surrounded by servants. He's riding in a cool, comfortable carriage. And this stone cutter slash king looked out of the carriage window and marveled at the power of the sun. He said to himself, I wish I were the sun. Pow, once again, his wish was granted and he became the sun, sending out waves of heat to the entire universe. And all went well for a while. Then one day, the stone cutter slash king slash sun tried to make his heat penetrate this thick cloud. But it couldn't. The cloud was blocking the sun's rays and they were too dense and the people below the clouds could not feel his heat. I wish I were a cloud, he said. And that's what he became. He became a cloud and he enjoyed his power to prevent the sun's heat from reaching the ground. And soon though, this stone cutter slash king slash sun slash cloud felt himself being pushed by a great force. And he realized that the force was the wind and that he was no match for it. I wish I were the wind, he said, and that's what he became as the mighty wind. He blew clouds and rain all over the kingdom. Sometimes he even blew down trees and buildings with all of his power. But he wasn't satisfied. And long enough, though, before the stone cutter slash king slash sun slash cloud slash wind found something that he could not move by blowing. It was a huge, towering stone. Glorious in its sheer size, weight, and strength. No matter how hard he tried, he just could not move that stone. I wish I were that stone, he said. And in an instant, it became the stone stronger than anything on earth. But while he stood there in all his stony glory, he heard the sound of a hammer and chisel pounding into solid rock. And he looked down and saw a stone cutter cutting chunks of rock from his feet. And the stone cutter slash king slash sun slash cloud slash wind slash stone said, how can a tiny creature like that be more powerful than a mighty rock like me? I want to be a man. And the stone cutter was instantly transformed back into a man. This is actually a, a proverb. It's a Jewish proverb. It's hundreds of, of years old. Um, but have you ever wished that in your life you had some other position? You know, you were somewhere else in your life. You know, I think we all get to a point sometimes where we reevaluate our life and we're th we have to think, you know, am I really where God wants me to be? The problem is sometimes we often, I think, get to this point and we don't say, is this where God wants me to be? But rather, am I satisfied with where I'm at? Paul wrote, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. We read this earlier, right? Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. It's Philippians 4.12. You know, I think the secret of being satisfied is being aware of the fact that God knows your need. He knows everything we need. And will always take care of us because he's a good father. James 1.17, keep your lives free from the love 
of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you or never forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5, he is all you need. And I think where I want to park a little bit more right now is this next point, and that's this, is that we have to be ready and willing to wage war against the culture in ourselves that we live in. If we are ever going to find satisfaction in the source that, you know, true satisfaction comes from, we have to be ready to wage war against ourselves and the culture. It's easy because we live in this culture that says we have to have more, more, more. We should never be satisfied with whatever we have. We should always seek more, 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 more. You know, it's easy to sort of, as we're immersed in this, to sort of allow that to penetrate our hearts and minds and lives in ways that it really shouldn't. And we have to be ready to go to battle against it. Because we're fallen creatures, greed is one of the states of our fallenness that we can sort of fall into the trap of and thinking that, man, this isn't enough. I can't just be satisfied in God. I got to have this. It's not God and nothing. It's God plus a nice house or God plus a better car, God plus a timeshare, because we're not just satisfied in that. We need to put our satisfaction, we need to get our sense of satisfaction from God if we are ever going to find true and meaningful satisfaction, a meaningful satisfaction that'll last for an eternity. Um, (laughs) God blesses us sometimes because he wants us to be good stewards of things. I don't know, hopefully you would agree with that. Um, but wouldn't it make sense that if for some reason we were bad stewards of what God blessed us with, that he may give it to somebody else? For an example of this, uh, just like to take a, I'm thinking of my own life. And you know, my, my, my daughters are almost to the age where maybe we could send them to the store to buy something. Okay. And uh, so let's say, for instance, mom and dad need some basic staples, milk, bread, you know, eggs, that sort of thing. And so we call the girls over and we say, okay, here's 20 bucks, you know, go to the store and go get us some milk, eggs, and bread, you know. And, and while you're there, since I love you and since I'm a good father, um, why don't you pick a treat up for yourselves as well? Okay, so we send the kids off and, and kid comes back, no milk, no eggs, no bread, big huge bag filled with candy, Right? Now, I would look at my kid, and I would ask, and I would hope you two would ask as well, hey, what happened? Oh, Dad, well, you didn't give me enough money. At that point, I would say, "Um, I did give you enough money. You stole it. (laughs) So here's 20 bucks. Learn your lesson. Be a good steward. Get on your bike. Go to the store and get the things we need, the milk, bread, and eggs. Kid goes to the store comes back, you know, ice cream, suckers, rented a video. Where's my milk, bread, and eggs? Well, you know, Dad, um, I'm going to need more money. You didn't give me enough. I think you're cheap. You're cheating me. I read in the Bible where good fathers provide things for their kids. So I hand the kid 20 bucks. All right. Go get me my milk, bread and eggs. Kid comes back, one loaf of bread, no milk. You know, rented a video game, you know, bought some more candy, pop, you know, all kinds of this stuff, toys, you know, and all this stuff. And and I go to them, what happened? Well, I didn't have enough. I only had enough for the bread. (laughs) You know, at some point, I think the point in this, at some point, I would take the two kids and I'd probably give that 20 bucks to the other kid and pray to God that I could get a loaf of bread for less than $60. <laughs> now, wouldn't it make sense that <laughs> some of the times we are in the troubles that we are, we don't find satisfaction in what God has provided for us because we're bad stewards of the things he has already given us. I know I struggle with that sometimes. I think the point is this, simply saying that God is looking for good stewards. He's looking for people that are going to find satisfaction in what he gives. You know, if we're just sort of bratty kids who keep blowing the money, saying you didn't give me enough, at some point it would make sense. You know, that he would trust his resources to someone who is more faithful and a better steward. Um, just sort of in closing here, 
we have a tendency to look at life from a very temporal perspective. In fact, um, got something back here. If I can reach it. <clears throat> this is an old illustration from um, a lot of youth ministry books of, of your. I've been in youth work for a long time, and I, I've been talking to my kids about this idea of understanding the eternal versus the temporal. And uh, I'm just going to come over. This didn't float. Joe, would you grab that rope? Take that rope and run around the room with it. Just, just go that way. It should come right off. It's not tangled up or anything. Just grab the end. Grab the one end. It should there. Just grab the end there. Other right behind you. There you bud. Just grab it. It'll come untangled. It's good. It's good. Just just go. Imagine this this rope. There you go. Thanks, Joe. Keep going. Awesome. Perfect. You can just drop it there. This rope. Imagine this rope wrap. This is you. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Imagine this rope goes on forever. Around the world, a million times it doesn't. It just stops over there. But imagine this rope goes on for forever. This is you. The problem with our culture, though, is that this represents how much life we have here. You know, we may get 80, 60, 70, 80, 100 years or something like that, but this is, this is what we've got here. And what the Bible says is that what we do here affects how we live here. And so our culture says, you know what, you got to save, save, save. You, you can never be satisfied because you want to live this little part of this piece of rope with all kinds of resources. You want to have the most comfortable life right here so you can never be satisfied here until you get enough, but it's never enough to live the rest of your life here. And what the Bible is saying, no, what you do here affects how you are going to live forever. In the millions and millions of years of your existence, what you do now is going to matter when you die, when this little red part expires. You have a shelf life. You know, and so a lot of times we, and oh, I'll tell you an example of this from recently, a lot of times people will come to us as Christians and they'll say, holy cow, why aren't you doing this, that, and the other in order to make this the best thing that you could possibly have when you're spending this time and you are investing in it, and they're saying you're stupid because, you know, you've got this and you're thinking, no, you're stupid because I've got this, Right? If you didn't get a chance to read the newsletter, I apologize if my article in there offended any of you. Um, my wife and, and kids uh, were going to Kenya in, in a few weeks, Lord willing, and we're not going because it's going to help us get here. In fact, it's, it really didn't help us get there any faster. <laughs> um, in fact, it's going this way, but people have been, you know, asking us and have been really concerned about our safety over there. Um, you know, and for certain, you know, for in some instances that might be reasonable. But we've, we've spent a year praying about this. And God has, has been intertwined into all of the plans for this mission that we're going on. And even though it's just two weeks. You know, we're not doing it because it's going to help us here. Our satisfaction, if we can find satisfaction in it, is going to be a blessing from God. If we come back safe, praise the Lord. If we don't, praise the Lord. Because what happens is this investment, what we invest in here, affects how we live here. Am I concerned for my safety? Sometimes, a little bit. Yes, I am, very much so. I'm very nervous of taking two beautiful blonde girls into a country that I've don't, I know nothing about. Although I have, you know, every, everything I've ever read and have been assured of by the missionaries who are working there, it's pretty safe. Still makes me a little nervous, having never been to Africa. But we need to quit finding our satisfaction or trying to find satisfaction in what is going to end here. Especially when, I mean, look at this. An eternity awaits. 
My spiritual challenge, my, my worship point today is this. True worship comes increasingly easy to those who increasingly find their satisfaction in the source of true satisfaction, Jesus. My spiritual challenge today is this. Embrace the fact that living your life under the sun, S-O-N, is the only way to find true satisfaction in your work in every other area of life. Look to Jesus for your, start, for your satisfaction and start living for the eternal. Um, you know, in this message, you know, I, um, I think in my own life, there's oftentimes, my wife knows this, my wife knows me more than anybody. You know, there's oftentimes when I don't find satisfaction in things. You know, and I feel I get caught up in the whole thing, you know. I got to have this, that, and the other. I got to have more and more and more. I'm not finding my satisfaction really in God. It's a, does, this, does this mean that, that it's bad to be blessed by God? No. Absolutely not. But if you look at people who are blessed by God, who recognize that source coming, is coming from God, that blessing is coming from God, there's, there's nothing wrong with being blessed by God. And we should find our satisfaction in God for whatever blessing he gives us. Whether you're Abraham or you're Job. Let's pray.